Little Bighorn, 1876. In late 1875, Sioux and Cheyenne left their reservations, outraged over the continued interference of gold miners in the Black Hills. They gathered in Montana with the great warrior Sitting Bull. To force the large native army back onto the reservations, the army dispatched three columns. One was led by Colonel George Custer and the 7th Cavalry. Custer spotted the Sioux village about 15 miles away but also a nearby group of about 40 warriors. He decided to attack the smaller party before they could alert the main party. He did not realize that the number of warriors in the village numbered three times his strength. Custer hoped to strike the encampment at the northern and southern ends simultaneously, but he discovered too late that he would have to negotiate a maze of bluffs and ravines to attack. Reno's squadron of 175 soldiers attacked the southern end. They found themselves in a desperate battle. Reno withdrew into the timber and brush along the river and then retreated uphill into the bluffs east of the river, pursued hotly by a mix of Cheyenne and Sioux. Just as they finished driving the soldiers out, the natives found roughly 210 of Custer's men coming toward the northern end of the village taking the pressure off Reno's men. Cheyenne and Sioux together crossed the river and slammed into the advancing soldiers, forcing them back into a long high ridge to the north. Custer and all of his men were killed in the battle that followed. The battle was the greatest defeat of the U.S. Army against Native Americans. Soldiers soon flooded the area, forcing the Sioux back onto their reservation. Chief Joseph and Geronimo. After a series of violent encounters with Americans in the spring of 1877, the Nez Perce of the Northwest were ordered onto a reservation. Chief Joseph fled to Canada with a large band of Nez Perce. He almost made it. The army cut off his escape and the Chief Joseph surrendered near the Canadian border. In the Southwest, Navajos and Apaches fought a series of battles to defend their lands. On September 4, 1886, the great Apache warrior Geronimo surrendered in Skeleton Canyon, Arizona after fighting for his homeland for almost 30 years. He was the last Native American warrior to formally surrender to the United States. They eventually agreed to live on reservations. The Massacre at Wounded Knee In the 1880s, Natives groups from the Plains began the Ghost Dance, a slow and solemn shuffle performed in silence to a slow single drum beat. The dance was a dream of returning to the old ways. In one Sioux village, 40 Native American policemen tried to stop the dance. Sitting Bull was killed. Troops killed others trying to flee. General Miles sent this telegram from Rapid City to General John Schofield in Washington, D.C. on December 19, 1890. The difficult Indian problem cannot be resolved permanently at this end of the line, he said. It requires the fulfillment of Congress of the treaty obligations that the Indians were entreated and coerced into signing. They signed away a valuable portion of the reservation and is now occupied by white people for which they have received nothing. They understood that ample provision would be made for this support. Instead, their supplies have been reduced and much of the time have been living on half and two thirds rations. Their crops, as well as the crops of the white people, for two years have been almost total failures. The dissatisfaction is widespread, especially among the Sioux, while the Cheyenne have been on the verge of starvation and were forced to commit depredations to sustain life. These facts are beyond question, and the evidence is positive and sustained by thousands of witnesses. On the morning of December 29th, troops went into a Lakota camp to disarm them. 
One story says that during the process of disarming, a deaf tribesman named Black Coyote was reluctant to give up his rifle, claiming he had paid a lot for it. A cavalryman grabbed the rifle and they scuffled, and the rifle went off. Five young Lakota men with concealed weapons then threw aside their blankets and fired their rifles at Troop K of the 7th Cavalry. At first, all firing was at close range. Half the Indian men were killed or wounded before they had a chance to get off any shots. Others grabbed rifles from the piles of confiscated weapons and opened fire on the soldiers. Soldiers assigned to a Hotchkiss gun opened fire against teepee camp full of women and children. It is believed that many of the soldiers were victims of friendly fire from their own Hotchkiss guns. The Indian women and children fled the camp seeking shelter in a nearby ravine from the crossfire. The officers had lost all control of their men. Some of the soldiers fanned out and finished off the wounded. Others leaped on their horses and pursued the natives, men, women, and children, in some cases for miles across the prairie. In less than an hour, at least 150 Lakota had been killed and 51 wounded. 31 troopers had also died and 33 were wounded. The soldiers loaded 51 survivors, four men, 47 women and children, onto wagons and took them to Pine Ridge Reservation. After the defeat at the Battle of Wounded Knee, the Indian Wars were over. Commander General Nelson Miles relieved Forsyth of command. This is the guy who was in charge. And he called an army court of inquiry to look into his actions. Testimony indicated that for the most part, troops attempted to avoid non-combatant casualties. That means they tried to avoid killing women and children and old people. The court criticized Forsyth for his decisions, but they cleared him of responsibility. The Secretary of War then reinstated or gave his job back. Miles continued to criticize Forsyth, whom he had believed had deliberately disobeyed his commands in order to destroy the Indians. In an effort to destroy the career of Forsyth, Miles promoted the idea that Wounded Knee was a deliberate massacre rather than a tragedy caused by poor decisions. The site of the massacre has been designated a National Historic Landmark by the U.S. Department of the Interior. In 1990, both houses of the U.S. Congress passed a resolution on the historic centennial, formally expressing deep regret for the massacre. The Dawes Act Reformers were outraged at the treatment of Native Americans and pushed Congress to act. The law that they came up with, however, was designed to help Native people, but it failed. It's called the Dawes Act. It gave each Native American male 160 acres to farm, and it also helped build schools. However, Native Americans longing for their traditional way of life generally resisted the Dawes Act. Confined to the Native uh, reservations, many Native Americans fell into poverty. <laughs> 